Right, so I suppose I should start by an introduction. Um, I'm Dave Snowden. I run the thing called the Canavian Company. Um, but I thought I'd start by effectively establishing some credentials for leadership. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some of my concerns about lead consulting for leadership with people with very little experience. So I thought I'd better, before that, kind of like give my own background. And I've been extremely lucky in my career, and I've had a series of great managers stroke leaders. I don't buy, for, by the way, the distinction between leaders and managers. All managers lead, all leaders have to manage. It's a crazy distinction. Um, and I've been lucky to have a series of them. Um, when I first you know, came out of um, a really early leadership positions in the student Christian movement, the World Student Christian Federation, um, I ended up as treasurer of the world thing. I was running a multi-million dollar business in my early 20s. And that sort of opportunity is really useful if you get a chance to do it in working on the program to combat racism in Australia and Latin America and elsewhere. Um, but then I moved into HR and had a really great boss, David, who actually taught me a lot by example. And then moved to probably one of my greatest bosses, a guy called Bob. And I want to tell a story about Bob to illustrate a point I'm generally making. Is most leadership, you actually learn by looking at what other leaders do and seeing their successes and their failures. And also by having your own failures mentored as it went through it. So this is my story of my getting it wrong and Bob teaching me something. So I'd moved across into finance. By now I'm deputy financial controller. I'm running the treasury side and responsible for all the computers. Um, still in my twenties. So that was reasonable going in that sense. And um, I found a group of electrical engineers. We were a survey company. Um, so we, you know, if, if you ever go to Dubai, uh, we actually did all the work to do the survey of the desert to establish the city, which was then built on it. So I'm quite proud every time I go there and think about the work we did on that one. Um, but either way, so we, we got a bunch of electrical engineers and I found them defrauding the company. So they'd all put in a series of expense claims. Uh, one of my clerks expressed a concern about it. I looked at it and because I'd previously been HR in training, I knew where this train course was. So we'd had 20 people all claimed a 30 pound taxi fare to get from the station to the hotel for a training course. Um, the hotel is five yards away from the station and there's only one train per day. So there was absolutely no way that they were being honest here. So it was obviously fraud. So I went along to Bob and said, can I have them all in? Yes, yeah, it's gross misconduct. Fire them all tomorrow. And he said, you're not doing that. He said, they're too expensive. They're critical to the business. There's no way you're firing them. He said, wait for the weekend and I'll show you what to do. So either way, I went away and these are the days by the way that it took 48 hours to run the general ledger at month end so the accounts department were all in every weekend um because there was you know you had to you know sing to the tape machine to load the tapes and you had to monitor the process all the way through so we're in that weekend and we went down to the electrical shop and he said hunt around for a bit so i did and i found a drawer full of blank receipts from all over the world um, books of the things and I said god Bob you're brilliant you know it's obvious the manager is on this so we're going to fire him him as well aren't we and he said no no you still haven't understood this and he said go and get one of those big metal trays from the marine yard so these are the trays we put survey instruments on on North Sea um, ships so I you know dragged this thing in and he says empty all the receipts onto that so I take the drawer and put all the receipts on that and ruffle them up a bit. And then he taps his pipe out on it. He was a smoker, you know, with the glowing embers. And gradually all the receipts burn into this charred mass of charcoal in the middle of the electrical shop. And he looks at me and he says, OK, yeah, it's out now. It's safe. Leave it there and see what happens on Monday. So Monday, the electrical engineers came in. They knew that we knew, we knew that they knew, everybody knew that we knew that they knew that they knew what you knew, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, expense claims went down to 30% to their previous level over the next month. And then he doubled the expense rates and gave them the chance to take one piece of equipment from every trip. And I said, what the hell? And he said, it was a weak signal. We weren't paying them enough, so they were defrauding the company. 
He said, look at what we've done. We've made them aware. They've seen it differently. They've changed their behavior so we don't need to do anything. Everybody's learned from the process. And that was one wise guy. And I could tell you lots of Bob's stories. And I could also tell you Mike's stories and Philip's stories. And I've been particularly blessed with bosses who just let me do what I thought I wanted to do and let me get on with it. Now, I say I learned more from that than from anything else. Yeah. Um, I went from finance deputy finance director to building systems for the likes of Guinness PLC, working at sea level, and then got to manage the business as a general manager, set up two software businesses, and then went on to strategy. And in my time, I've actually led the leadership programs for IBM's top 300, working directly with Lou Gerstner, worked with Clayton Christians on the leadership development programs for Chanel. So I'm coming from a mixture of actually doing it at sea level and actually taking the leadership role and understanding it. And then more recently, from the academic perspective, of starting to understand what's called naturalizing sense making, which includes complexity theory, as well as cognitive neuroscience and anthropology and everything else. And I think as I've gone through that period, I've been on more leadership training courses than I care to think. I've read more books on leadership than I ever want to inflict on anybody else in my lifetime. And I've got more frustrated by both of them than anything else, because all they do is to list a set of platitudes. There are kind of like two types of books. One, uh, you know, we'll come up with some words that nobody can disagree with. You know, leaders need to be inspirational. They need to be good communicators. They need to listen to people. They need to be aware of other perspectives. Well, it doesn't take much to know that if you don't know that you shouldn't be a leader anyway and the books go on and with lots of retrospective cases you yeah? but there's nothing in the books about how do you how do you get people to be like that yeah, that that's kind of like a missing missing angle on it you also get the sort of confusion of correlation with causation so people go and study successful leaders and they study successful leaders by interviewing them well I mean, i've done a lot of ethnography in large companies what managers and leaders say about what they do is completely different from what workers experience of the reality. If you're going to do research into leadership, you need to do one or two years deep immersion ethnography into the company, not just do a few interviews with the leaders themselves and draw general conclusions from that. And that's kind of like really bad research. Um, but anyway, and you, you can't determine general approaches to leadership. If you look at the history of leadership theory, Really, until the 1940s, 50s, it's all about actual moral virtue. If, if you read the literature, it goes back to Aristotle and, and ethics. OK, there's a sort of classy element in it in that only people from the aristocracy are deemed to have those skills and the public schools of England trained in them. But it's all about moral character. Now, that, that's kind of like what the literature talks about. And we may have lost a bit of that. And I still quite like some of that material. I think it's quite good. I think Aristotle is brilliant on that. Um, so is McIntyre. If you haven't read McIntyre, who's a Arist modern Aristotelian, um, talking about ethics in business and ethics in education, he's worth reading. So then what happens in the 40s and 50s is the, the field divides into two. One seeks to identify the qualities that leaders have, and the other says entirely based on context. And really, that sort of divide has gone on ever since. I actually think it's a mixture of both, to be honest. Yeah, And you get things like behavioralism. You get my pet, bet noir of the moment, adult development theory, which I think is not only wrong, but evil. Um, I may come back to that one later. Um, but fundamentally, you either get the focus on how do we change the individual to make them a leader, or how do we change the context so that people can become good leaders? And from a complexity perspective, you need to do both. I think that's one of the key principles. Yeah? Um, and I really want to talk about leadership. So what I want to do is to talk through a series of methods and tools. Um, I'll make a general point about complexity up front. I'm not here to define complexity, simplify complexity, or do anything else. Because to be honest, the best way to understand complexity is to use methods and tools which have been designed based on its principles. You don't need to do the theory to understand the practice anymore. And where we are in market life cycle at the moment is we've gone from complexity being early adopters, difficult to sell. You had to give them a lot of words. You had to explain the theory. 
So at the moment, certainly from our point of view, people are saying, what can you do for us? They're not concerned about how we do it. They just know that we're good at doing something different and therefore they're buying the methods or buying the tools. And that's what happens when a market goes from early adopter to early majority stage. Yeah? And I'll say up front now, complexity is now in that state. Yeah, you know, kind of like we had scientific management up to the 80s. We had stuff based on systems dynamics and to some extent cybernetics, really from the 80s, 90s to the current days. We're now in, into a sort of complexity, cognitive, and biology is actually far more important. Uh, my latest framework, if you haven't seen it, is based on constructor theory and quantum mechanics. That's estuarine framing. So there's a body of new science coming in, which is producing extremely practical methods and tools which don't require any theoretical knowledge in order to use them. Yeah. So what I can do is to run through a series of those. I think some of you will be with me in Copenhagen. We now put together a new course and set of tools under the general badge of rewilding leadership. So we're taking that rewilding concept from ecology, which is not to return to something in the past, but to restore a balance yeah, in terms of the way things work. So that's the principle. Yeah. So what I want to do is to run through a series of those, talk about the background to them, and then finish off with some new ways to frame the whole issue of leadership. Yeah? And I'm going to say up front, I'm trying to avoid at all costs defining leadership competences. Yeah. Now, you know, I've seen this in a whole bunch of books, all right? Somebody, and I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to vary it a bit. I actually did some work with Steve Jobs. I had a pile of books thrown at me and I was sworn at. I'm still quite proud of that um, just before he came back to Apple. Um, I worked with Lou Gerstner on leadership development. Yeah, I worked with the CEOs of GE um, and Chanel and half a dozen others. Yeah, They had absolutely nothing in common except the male leaders were all arrogant, opinionated bastards. But I've yet to see a management textbook which recommends becoming an opinionated bastard because that wouldn't sell the numbers you wanted. But I've seen any number of books that fit those leaders who I knew personally into their frameworks or their models of competence. And it's like shoehorning something, you know, it, it's the Cinderella story and it's the ugly sister. They're sort of shoehorning, you know, you know, something really ugly into this sort of beautiful glass slipper as it goes. I need to be careful on my metaphors here. So I'm going to try and avoid any question of competences. The other reason I'm going to do that is 101 complexity theory, by the way, is that competences are emergent properties of the way people interact with each other and things. And the trouble is we confuse an emergent property. So we see that somebody's a great leader and we see they do, do these things. And then we assume if we train people to do those things, they'll be a great leader. We forget the reason they are those, do the, you know, or both of them are emergent properties. The things that they've done, the encounters they've had have produced those qualities and produced the leadership. So it's, it's a confusion of emergent properties that you see in, in an awful lot of leadership theory. Yeah. So let me run through a couple of examples of, of stuff we're doing. So one is... And I'm going to do this in the context of what you actually see. So one of the big things we say to leaders is you have to see things from different perspectives. Right now, OK, that's good news. Yeah, you have to listen and pay attention to your staff. That's really good news. I've yet to meet any leader on any course who doesn't agree that's a good thing and doesn't write a pledge at the end to say they'll do more of it. And I've yet to meet anybody who actually goes through with it. Uh, one of the things consultants and trainers need to realize is the results at the end of the training do not reflect the reality of what happens in the months and weeks after the training. Yeah, It's easy to get a result at the time. Um, so we've done a couple of things on that. When I was working with Ian Letchley, you might remember he was CEO of Smith Klein Beecham. And I was still in IBM in the early days there, and I was working on the merger of Smith Klein Beecham um, directly with the CEO. And one of the things we did for him was to create a virtual environment. This is actually before Second Life, entirely composed of Atavars, and nobody knew that some of them were the CEO. Now, that was me taking a medieval model. In medieval times, the kings once a year used to dress up in ordinary clothes and go and drink in the taverns. Well, you can't do that anymore. So we created a virtual environment where you could have conversations with people and he found out more through those virtual environments through through anything else. Now, you see what I'm doing? We're not we're, we're creating a, an environment and a tool which produces the behavior we want. 
We're not just issuing admonitions for that behavior to happen. Yeah. Uh, working with Bradford and Bingley and Tesco, this is sound like senior leaders base. We took senior leaders, including three main board directors from Tesco, and made them work in Bradford and Bingley, which is a bank, as counter clerks for a week. And we took their equivalent in the bank and made them work to stack shelves in Tesco's. Now, we couldn't put Tesco directors onto the floor in Tesco's because everybody knew who they were. But what we did is we put people in leadership positions to do menial jobs for a week so that they could see things from a different perspective. And that was a huge innovation program, by the way. Things came across from retail, retail food into retail banking, which is still now standard practice from that individual program. But again, what you do is we're physically changing the way that people act, interact rather than giving them lectures about the sort of behavior that they need to exhibit. All right. And that sort of transparent stuff actually works quite well in terms of the way it happens. And you can still do that. The other thing, this comes out of an EU project. So we were funded on the Ponte project um, last year um, to look at how do you handle fake news? And we took a different line from everybody else. We decided needed to pe people needed to see things um, from other perspectives, but there was no point in telling them to do that. And we now have this, it's now about to become available for companies as well. We have what are called meaning walls, which are sort of graphical displays in which you can see stories in oral video, yeah, or pictorial or um, audio form, yeah. You can see them represented into fitness landscapes, what we call narrative landscapes. We use visualization heavily. And you can sort of click on some of them or look at some of them, and then you can interpret those. And then you get shown how the people who created them interpreted them. And you're asked, why is it different? Yeah. Now that's hugely impactful because you're not trying to say, listen to other people. You're saying, well, they told these stories. You find those stories interested. This is how you interpreted the stories. This is how they interpreted the stories. Why do you think it's different? In effect, you're asking people questions so that they see that we have different perspectives. Yeah? And that can be quite powerful. We do a lot of that work, you know, for example, gathering stories from um, ordinary workers about something which is relating to current strategy, presenting those stories as a cluster to senior leaders and say, interpret those. And then we show them after they've interpreted how the ordinary employees interpret it. And it's never the same, by the way. There are some overlaps and there are some gaps. And we say, why do you think those differences have happened? Yeah. So I've just given you three methods or approaches which actually handle a lot of the admonitions of leadership consultancy, not by telling people to change, but by putting them in situations where the sort of behavior you want is more likely to emerge. So change the context so the behavior changes. Yeah. Uh, we're now extending that. We first did this with the senior leadership on Chanel. So we're launching a Gemba version of the product to, to allow continuous journaling. Now, this is something you can do, by the way. I'll give you two HR examples on this. One is when new joiners join the company, we give them the software. So for their first three months, they have to give a, keep a daily diary. You can make new joiners do that. They don't, you know, they, they're new to the company. They do what they're told. And then every two or three days, they get to go and interview somebody very senior in the company and gather their stories. And senior people will tell stories to young joiners, but they won't tell stories to knowledge management professionals or consultants. But somebody young has just joined the company, comes along or shatters them for a day, they learn all sorts of stuff. So we institutionalize that, we build those narratives into software, we divide peer-to-peer -peer learning across those channels. So that's what we did so with the senior leadership group. Goes Gruel. So you've got a senior leadership group. Yeah. You know, well, they've got to, you know, they've got to do what you tell them. I mean, they're they're actually on training. They're designed to be the next elite. So you can get them to do all sorts of things. So we kept daily morning and evening journals of what they were learning. The stories they told were shared with the peer group, which was hugely valuable. So people saw things differently. But then once a week, they had to go and interview, for example, a customer in a Chanel store or a junior member of staff and actually gather those people's stories. And then those stories were interpreted by other people in the leadership group. The results were compared. We created this rich narrative of differences in perspectives 
which actually informed the whole leadership development cohort as it went through the process. Yeah. And again, what's interesting, we did one of those for IBM originally, um, the database was kept up by those managers after they finished the course because it was so valuable to share that learning at that sort of micro narrative or fragmented base. And you can get more extreme on this. Um, the one I did in IBM, which was Sharon and myself, um, it was very wicked, um, but Lou was prepared to back us and we sort of got away with it, except with Joel Crawley. Uh, but I'll come back to Joel Crawley later and I'm prepared to name him by name because I think his behavior was detestable. Right? Um, so what we did is we've got, I, what Lou did is he had a top 300 in IBM and every six months, 30 joined and 30 left. It was a pretty savage environment, to be honest. I mean, if you left, you know, you, you didn't lose your job or anything. You just realized you weren't going to make main board or very senior leadership. It was a sort of proving point. And I remember briefing him on complexity theory, and he gave a brilliant lecture on complexity theory based on a 10 minute brief. But one of the points he said to the group, which was very simple, he said, you've all succeeded so far by being selfish and achieving your targets. You've got to carry on doing that. But now you've got to prove you can work for the good of the company as well. And he said, most of you won't make the transition. And that was actually quite wise, if you think about it, at that sort of level. So either way, so what we did is we, and we used Kinevin for this. So we told each leader to identify four groups of people. People who they had no knowledge of who, who obeyed their orders. Now they had to go and find somebody else to nominate in that category, but all leaders have people in that. Uh, experts whose evidence they relied on, but they didn't necessarily like personally. Uh, people they really trusted and they talked to all the time and people they worked within a crisis, but not otherwise. So you've got the clear, complicated, complex, chaotic, if you think about it. And we gathered stories from each of those individuals. And then we showed each leader the pattern of the stories told about them by their own staff in each of the four main Kinevin domains which showed them that they were different in different contexts and gave them a rich body of experience to draw on. But then we got really wicked. So we gave them a whole set of you know, stories about great leaders of the past, both good and bad. You know, we had Stalin, Hitler, Roosevelt, Lincoln, Churchill, whatever. There was a debate on Churchill. I'm Welsh and Sharon's Welsh. And from the Welsh point of view, Churchill is a villain, not a hero. Um, but it was eventually agreed because we were working with Americans. Um, and then we got them all to tell stories about those leaders and index those stories. And then we actually did a little bit of statistical analysis and we showed them which of those leaders of the past, their staff had indexed the stories about them the way they'd index the stories about the great leaders. And that's where Gerald Crawley fell over because he was 100% aligned with Stalin with a slight touch of Hitler. And I still remember he came storming into the room, screaming at me saying, how dare you say this? This is a total disgrace. And we said, well, we didn't do anything, did we? You know, they index the stories, you index the stories. This is a mathematical calculation. I didn't manipulate this. Yeah. Um, and then three other leaders said, well, you're kind of like proving his point really, aren't you? By the way, you're reacting to the learning. So that, that was an entertaining experience, but I made an enemy for life. And he went on to be head of strategy for IBM. So that was an interesting experience. But again, you see, this is a principle in complexity we developed years ago called descriptive self-awareness. We don't go and tell people. It's why I don't like coaches. And it's why I don't like adult development theory, because it says, I am the expert. I can tell you what you need to go through. We don't do that. We say, you did it like this. They did it like that. What does it mean? So it's a non-judgmental form of learning. Yeah, in terms of the way it works. And that sort of comparison thing is, again, it's easy to set up. You integrate it in with development programs. You do all that sort of stuff as you go. Yeah. So I've given you, and that's several methods that we go through that. Yeah. Now, the other thing I want to talk a bit about in this connection is the new work we're doing on distributed leadership. Now, distributed leadership is different from delegated leadership or delegated decision making. Um, I've got to finish writing this up for the NHS in Whitehall before I go home this week. So well, there are a couple of principles behind this. And I'll make this general point. Part of the problem you've got in Northern Europe, North America, is an excessive focus on the individual. 
Uh, there's a famous experiment on this, by the way, and I'm not going to do it. There's too many people on the group. You give people three things and you say, which is the odd one out? You all remember that from when you were a kid? So you can all do this mentally and decide whether you're going to confess it or not. And we say, what's the odd one out between cow, chicken and grass? Yeah? And everybody writes it down. Now, the North American, Northern American, North, Northern Europe norm is to eliminate grass because cow and chicken are animals. Whereas a Latin American, Celtic, African, Asian norm is to eliminate chicken because the cow has got a relationship with grass. So what are called commutarian cultures see the individual as defined by their relationships with the community. Whereas atomistic cultures see the community as defined by the agreements of the individuals, which is where you get social contract theory and everything else. And the trouble is most management science is dominated by atomism. Um, from a complexity point of view and a cognitive science point of view, I think the science has now come out on the side of commutarianism. We are defined by our interactions more by any innate qualities that we have. Doesn't mean that there aren't innate qualities. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the interactions more or less define us. And yeah, Ivers Brown, Geography of Thought is a great book. Yeah. Um, so that one is quite useful to use. But the excessive focus on an individual is a problem. The other thing is, some of you know, we recently announced a new initiative with the Carter Center at George Washington University in, in Washington on peace and conflict resolution. Now, this comes and takes me back to work I was doing in Northern Ireland in the 70s. Some of you heard this story before, it makes the point. There were two approaches to peace. And for those who don't know what Northern Ireland was like in the 70s, you know, I was young, idealistic. I was going to be a Jesuit priest at that time. So I was in orders, in training, right? And I remember walking down the Falls Road in Belfast and the police, you know, the Royal Ulster Constabulary picked me up in a Land Rover and asked me which of my legs did I want broken first? And I sort of protested that I prefer not to have any legs broken. They heard my accent and realized I was a mainland Catholic, not an Irish Catholic. So they threw me out of the Land Rover. You know, if the Provo commander had come around that night, I might well have joined, to be honest. All right? And it was that level. I mean, Catholics didn't have the vote back in the 60s and so on. So it was a quite traumatic environment. And there was a major initiative to get people together. So we'll get Catholics and Protestants together in large numbers, in big halls, and talk about how we're all going to get on and we're going to stop throwing petrol bombs. And we got a lot in common. Now, this was wonderfully satirized in episode one of series two of of Dairy Girls, which if you haven't seen it, is brilliant. And I'll put the link in the chat now, um, in which the Catholic girls are forced into a peace and reconciliation process supervised by a trendy Roman Catholic priest who reminds me of a lot of consultants, uh, watched over by a cynical nun. She's one of the great characters in the series and an equal cynical Protestant teacher. And they put a blackboard up for everything we've got in common and a blackboard up for everything which is different. And by the end of the session, everything is different. There's nothing in common. And the famous phrase on that is Protestants keep their toasters in cupboards. It's that level of trivia. Yeah? Um, and it ends up, if you don't know the episode, in absolute conflict with them having a major fight over a complete misunderstanding. Yeah, and it all goes badly wrong. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry that's not longer available. I'll have to find another version of it. Um, either way, Dairy Girls, you might as well watch the whole thing. It's on Netflix anyway. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, three series, never be another one. Um, we took a different approach. We took two Catholics and one Protestant or two Protestants and one Catholic, and we dumped them into Latin America for six months. And we didn't talk about the troubles. And they pretty fast discovered, because they were working in slum areas in Rio, that they had more in common than they realized. And they had a conversation about their differences when they were ready to have it without a facilitator telling them what they should think. Again, I'm coming back to this principle of self-awareness being Cree and discovering things in your own time at your own pace, but managing the environment in terms of the way it works. So that actually, I now know more of the theory on that. The minute a group gets to more than five, people sort into their tribes. You can get people from radically different backgrounds in very small groups of three, and provided they're not talking about the subject which divides them, they're doing something which they find in common, they'll work together. 
So small groups of people from different backgrounds are able to act together in a way that groups beyond those numbers are not. Uh, this isn't Dunbar, by the way. This is some much more sophisticated stuff from evolutionary biology and elsewhere. It's called the scaffolding of um, systems. Yeah. If anybody wants to reference, I can find that for you later. So we know that you can't go to a group of more than five before you have a problem. So one of the things we started to develop some time ago was the basic concept of what was called the entangled trios. Now, this is like all of our methods. This is open source. It's on kinevin.io. Anybody can go and use the methods. We just like you to participate. All right. So you're not in fact, a lot of the methods. We never get to see what people do with them. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. So the way entangled trios works is you define different roles. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of the ones we did in the South Wales Valleys, and I talk about this a lot because I was involved, we had young, you know, what are called hoodies in the UK. So young teenagers uh, were put in a pair with somebody from their grandparents' generation. And the third member of the trio was somebody from local government who could make their ideas work. Yeah, it's transgenerational pair, pairing is the technique. Now, there's a lot of science behind this. Your brain is very plastic until early 20s, female, late 20s, male. Then it locks down until late 40s, 50s. It becomes plastic again. So you tend to see innovation in older pe people is linking is synthesis. You see that in the humanities, whereas in younger people, it's bright ideas. People in the middle group are basically managing the family, managing the tribe. They haven't got time to do anything else. Yeah. So by putting very young people with people much older or new joiners with people about to retire, that's called a transgenerational pair. It's extremely effective. We've done it with doctors in training, with senior surgeons as well. But then your third role is somebody who's got money and power who can make their ideas work. So we're using that an awful lot for innovation programs. And we're now starting to use it for delegated decision making. So basically, we define a trio. Right? And the trio can make any decision. It's got delegated authority. Uh, we just put that into the Gemba system. And what we're now allowing to take place is that you can make the decision, record the decision, and there can be a 10-hour, 3-hour, 5-hour, 12-hour lag based into it by which senior leaders can review. And if they don't object, you can do it anyway. So we're not delegating to an individual, we're delegating to three people in different roles. In more sophisticated versions of that now, we're algorithmically allocating people into trios, so it can't be gamed. And we've just introduced a variation by which one member of the trio is an Atavar. You have no idea who is representing the Atavar, it may be a group. So instead of making the individual take full responsibility for every decision, which means they'll worry about what the leader would have done, we delegate into groups of three people from radically different backgrounds working with each other in that context. Now, we've already done some statistical work on that. We can take out about 40 or 50% of bureaucracy by that method with better visibility and better audit control. And it's like I'm dealing with a dislocated finger at the moment all right now, do not go walking in ireland and keep your you, you're meant to take the thongs off the trekking poles if you're likely to slip i didn't so it took the finger out i reset it twice coming down but it's, it's now been stretched all right so i'm i'm getting a good relationship with a physio you know we're getting on because i see her every week well she bends you know, it goes into hot wax she then bends it and replasters it um it suffers pain for about 24 hours, and then we wait for the whole week to start again. I think physios were born out of medieval torturers, to be honest, but she's quite nice. And she's actually, you know, Southwest region's main physiotherapist for hands. But she can't make decisions without writing business plans, which she's not qualified to do and she doesn't want to do. So one of the things we're starting to look at is, well, if she worked with a consultant who she doesn't know, you see how this works. You basically delegate into roles working with each other. So you've got transparency and variation rather than delegating to individuals. And that's an example of changing the way we do leadership, which also allows younger people and people with less experience to be in trios because they then bring naive perspectives to the trio, but they're not being forced into extended, extended risk in terms of their way. We put all leaders under extreme psychological stress and it's not good for them and it's not good for us. 
Yeah, this sort of method removes the stress because you've got three people and we can start to see who comes up and how we get there and how we deal with, with stuff from that. So that's, that's kind of some of our latest thinking in terms of the way we work. Uh, and I could go on and talk about other methods. We're about to launch a major new version of Gemba just for the coaching market. And for anybody who's got a little bit obsessed with adult development theory, despite the fact there is absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever, but if you like it, then we can actually use the Keegan stages, for example, as what are called modulators in complexity. So it's not a linear stage, but we can say these will be present in different contexts at different times. So one of the reasons we're launching that is so a coach working with leaders, and this is the real heavy point I want to make before I go on to the final point, instead of saying you need to have this behavior, uh, we want to ask people questions. Why did they see it like this? Why did you see it like that? Or then critically, and this is called vector theory of change, we want to say, what are you going to do tomorrow to create more stories like this and fewer stories like those? Okay. Now, anybody can get that, and then they can go, and the stories provide rich context. So I'll give you the example from 360. So the classic 360 approach is once a year, you have a heavily game system in which individuals evaluate people in leadership positions. If you haven't learned to game it yet, you haven't learned how to survive in a corporate environment. Now, I got into a lot of trouble with IBM HR because I actually set up a database where you could nominate yourself to be somebody's third quartile responder using dating agency software um, to make the gaming even easier for people. And that was in place for three years before they found it. Right? Um, the problem is human beings don't like to evaluate other human beings. I think it's a heavy level of stress. I'm not sure. I don't think any current 360 is ethical, to be honest, because it's quite easy for the leader to work out who said what about them. So we don't do that. Um, Basically, leader, Gemba system, every time you encounter the leader, you describe the encounter. Now, you don't evaluate the leader, you describe the encounter. And then high abstraction metadata, something to be developed and patented. So we give people six triangles. One of the triangles says, in this encounter, the leader's behavior was analytic, altruistic, assertive. So three positive qualities. So people describe an interaction, they then basically place that interaction onto six triangles. They can not, apl not apply them if they want. All of the triangles have positive labels, so they can't say anything negative about the leader. But then the leader looks at the results and they can see they're all analytical assertive. They're not altruistic. So they need to rebalance. And they can look at the observations and say, I need more like this and fewer like that. Or they can sit down with their people and say, look, guys, I need more of these, fewer of that. What can you do to help me? Yeah, because it's description, not evaluation, and it's not got the negative aspect of judgment in it. And again, you see that principle of descriptive self-awareness and this fundamental principle of the way you change people's behavior is to show them contrasts and give them examples rather than giving them abstract language about qualities that you think they should possess. Yeah? So that's the deeply pragmatic side. Okay, then in the final 10 minutes, and I want to leave 15 minutes for questions, conversation, or if anybody wants to try, you know, argue with me, that I'm very happy with that. It would wake me up. Yeah. I've just struggled through torrential rain and gale force winds off Welsh 2000 footers, and I've only just got off alive. So I'm feeling quite good about life at the moment. All right. But I've lost my rucksack cover. Um, so uh, I want to give you two framings. Uh, one is more or one is more controversial than the other. Two of the words that I think we should get rid of in management are mindset and mental models. Yeah, uh, one of the reasons to get rid of mental models is it was a cute idea in the 1980s, but it's really bad science. Uh, we now know that consciousness is not just cognitive, it's physical, it's extended into our social environment, it's reliant on action, it's called the four E's, if you don't know it, right? So the idea that consciousness and decision-making is entirely a cognitive process is actually wrong. And if we talk about mental models, it's sort of like a computer metaphor. And actually it came out of the early days of computing when people were seeing human beings as computing or to quote my daughter's A-level psychology textbook, the human brain is a limited capacity information processing device. Now, I withdrew her from that course the minute I read the textbook, right? Um, 
Yeah, so coming back to this, I shouldn't go down that digression on daughters, all right? But she's arriving here in an hour's time, so I'm thinking of it. Um, so basically, consciousness is not co-located with the brain. The brain does not make decisions like a computer makes decisions. Talking about mental models is the wrong metaphor and the wrong science, and it leads us into the wrong sorts of decisions. Uh, mindset has slightly more utility. You know, I, I use the phrase from time to time. But again, the danger with it is we end up making individuals responsible. You know where it works. I've, I've launched this major agile program across the whole company. It was wonderful. Yeah, the, the consultants told it was to be wonderful. We thought it would be wonderful. It hasn't worked. You didn't have an agile mindset. It's all your fault. And I've seen that in organizational change. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, if you had the right mindset, my idea would have worked. That's the classic leadership response, right? Um, again, the real problem with that is the problem that actually most decisions are made in different ways. So we now have now, now a thing called the three A's. Yeah. What we talk about is agency, assemblage, and affordance. Now, the reason we talk about those three is the language you use to describe a problem fundamentally influences the way you solve it. So if you describe a problem as a mindset, you're gonna try and change individuals, which A, you can't do, and B, isn't ethical anyway. If you say, who or what had agency in this situation, can we change it? That's a sensible decision. If you say, what are the affordances provided? And that can be education, decision capacity, history, experience, affordances is a complex concept. It's not something to oversimplify, but fundamentally we can measure affordances in the environment. Yeah? And then finally, assemblage, this is a reference to Deleuze, all right? And it kind of like, may not be the best word, but it, it links with the literature. It's the entrained patterns of assembled stories over time, which determine our culture. Uh, actually, we now know, if you don't know about epigenetics, we now know the biological mechanism by which culture inherits, which has major implications for leadership theory. But I'll leave that for the moment, that's probably too big. So basically, in any environment, there's a whole body of stories which surround you in society, and this is fractal between society and companies, which determine the way you see the world. Yeah, I'm still recovering. I refused to teach at a Texas university three years ago, and they sent me a manual on how not to provoke your students. And I phoned them up and said, I've never not provoked a student in my life. It's part of what I enjoy doing. If they can't cope with that, I don't teach them. They said, oh, but next year they'll have machine guns in your classroom. And it was, okay, I'm not coming anymore, right? Now, we have the same genetic background. We have no guns in Britain since Dunblane, except behind locked cupboards, right? It's the patterns of the stories we grow up in. It's not genetic. It's those patterns create what are called attractor wells or assemblages. They're difficult to escape, and we can map those. Now, we do work with Gaping Void, for example. If you don't know Gaping Void cartoons, go and look at them. Sorry, they're illustrations, not cartoons. I get into trouble with Jason if I say that. But basically, we present cartoons. People tell a story about what the, in which they choose a cartoon which represents their company culture. They tell a story about that and index it. And from that, we can actually mathematically map the story patterns which are determining the way people behave. Then you can make a decision to try and change them. So if you describe a problem in terms of agency, assemblage, affordance, you're describing it in a way that you can then make differences in order to produce the right results. And I do a lot of that if I'm coaching an individual leader is to look at things through those perspectives, not from the perspective of their mindset, their maturity. It's kind of like, what, you know, have you got the affordances? Yeah, it, it's those sort of questions that you ask. That's one framework. The other, which we started to bring back lately, is an old knowledge management one I created called Ashen. This is a mnemonic. Um, it's part of a whole knowledge mapping exercise. Um, that we're about to launch a cohort on that, which is up on the way horse on the web website at the moment to run that. Basically, Ashen stands for artifact skills, heuristics, experience, and natural talent. So basically, artifacts are things which are man made. Yeah, artist factor. So those can be spreadsheets, tools. We have to learn to use the tools, etc. Well, that's a skill. Anybody ever tried to plaster a wall? You know, I've, I've done it once and I'm never ever going to do it again. It took me a week and involved heavyweight sanders, whereas a real plasterer can do it in half an hour. Yeah. But I know the process of acquiring the skill. Yeah. 
And then we get H, which stands for heuristics and ha habits. Uh, I've written a whole blog series on habits. Habits are things that we build into people's day-to-day -day practice because they reduce the energy cost of decision-making, and so are heuristics. So mapping the habits and heuristics in a leadership group can tell you far more than virtually anything else, and you can decide which you're going to actually put together, which you're going to reinforce, which you're going to disrupt. Then we move on to experience. Yeah. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, and I've been there twice, if you're on the urge of bankruptcy, you see the world very differently thereafter. Yeah, no amount of, you know, no amount of teaching you it can tell you it unless you've lived it, yeah, in terms of understanding the implications. So there's a whole body of experiences, bugger all to do with maturity, it's down to experience. Yeah? Some experiences, where you, when you have them, how you have them, how you react to them, are fundamental. And then natural talent, some people regrettably are just better at doing things than others. I mean, I've met a lot of natural leaders in my life. I refuse to accept this nonsense that there's no such thing as a leader. I've seen leaders make a huge difference. And some people are just really good at it. Now, there may be biological reasons for that. There may be experiential reasons, but some people are just bloody good at doing it. So we now look at a problem. Instead of saying, you know, how do we replace Amy, sorry, Amy Lane, you're right in the middle of my screen, so you're getting picked on this. Yeah. yeah, how do we replace Amy? You say, well, Amy has this combination of, you know, artifact skills, heuristics, experience, and natural talent. How do we replace that? Yeah, and that changes the knowledge management agenda considerably. Now, we're now actually, this is um, Anne and Hannah's idea, so I'm grateful to them for it. We're now using Ashen as a leadership framing. Right? Because actually artifacts can be distributed or regimented, experience you can manage. So we look at leaders through the lens of ASHEN to see what's happened and what hasn't happened, what we should replicate. Again, it's looking at things from different perspectives to see what sort of patterns that we can get out of it. So what I tried to do is to give you a sort of practical stuff. And I'm now allowed to indulge myself with two of the latest things off the shelf, which I will be a bit academic about, but if anybody's interested. Um, the work we do on an estrine mapping maps the energy gradients of what's possible. So it takes constraint mapping, um, something Alicia first brought us into, and then we created a whole typology of constraints. Um, resilient, robust, using heavyweight metaphors, and we're building more of those. So we can map constraints and we can gather those at scale across the whole company. And we place them then on an energy grid. Um, so basically energy cost of change against time to change. And the top right of that are counterfactuals, things which are never gonna change. And the bottom left is high volatility. And then we focus people on changing the energy cost of change rather than trying to achieve the change. You see the subtlety of this? You say, if we want that to change, how can we reduce the energy cost to change or the time to change and then see if it happens? And that is actually being taken up at sea level, board level, and by some of the big software. It's taken up rapidly over six months since I launched it and published it. It's actually the practical extension of the EU field guide on complexity management. Um, it's good, from my point of view, it's bigger than Kinevin, all right, in terms of its potential. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like one thing um, that we're currently working on on that. Um, the other big thing that we're now about to start work on is what's called the waggle dance. So the, the way bees make decisions, yeah, so they, the drones decide they've had enough, so they hatch a new queen, and then the swarm goes off and hangs on a tree. And then individual bees fly off to find a new hive, and they come back to the swarm, and they literally dance on the, on the swarm with their tail pointed to where the source is and other bees will then go and investigate it. And some bees actually push other bees off if they don't like what that bee's saying, they'll, they've got a negative feedback as well as a positive one. And after about two days, the swarm suddenly knows where to go. We're now building that into distributed decision-making for leaders. Now we've already done distributed ideation and distributed um, ethnography. What we're now looking at is basically presenting and representing a problem to multiple trios, getting feedback from those trios until a consensus emerges. And that's a radical alternative you know, to a lot of the statistical forecasting packages in terms of the way it works. 
So I've given you a whole body of established tools and methods. I've talked about two of the new things that we're actually working on. Um, and I've left 10 minutes or so for questions or comments if anybody wants to raise them. And I haven't been monitoring chat, I'm afraid, so my apologies for that. All right, yeah, the, um, maybe if you have a question, put it in the chat. I think there was maybe one Dave up here that was... Um, this is from Christian. Uh, would you say that using attitude instead of mindset is still problematic because it puts responsibility on the individual? It's it's better it's better than mindset, but it's still got a high cognitive load to it. I mean, I, th I think about 70, 80 percent of your decisions are actually made by your body, not by your brain anyway. Um, and actually, we'd argue an even bigger percentage are made by the social interactions and the social mores of where you grow. So I, I really think we need to get away from individuals. It's why we're working to distributed leadership in trios into collective things like the Waggle Dance. We, we've got to think collectively, not individually, because the trouble with individual concepts, you end up with this huge thing about heroic leaders. Right, and the last thing we want are bloody heroic leaders at the moment. I've had enough of them to serve my lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there are a couple of questions. I don't know if you want me to, if it's helpful for me to read or if you want to read them. Um, AI is quite interesting at the moment. Um, and I've been playing with the new tools as well. I mean, it's, we, we've actually got a poem about Kenevin, which is Bethic, which is really rather good. Right? Um, the, the trouble, I think, with AI is it's always going to work with what's available, not with what's novel. I think this is the problem. So basically, computers think inductively. Humans naturally think abductively. Um, abduction is a great contribution of the American pragmatist is logic. Yeah, It's basically we make intuitive leaps between things. Uh, the upside, it makes us highly innovative. The downside is it makes us prone to conspiracy theories. And if you don't know it, biologically, that comes from the fact that art preceded language. We drew and made music before and lang our language evolved from music and art, not from naming things. I actually disagree with Sonia on that, by the way. I don't think most languages are dominated by nouns. I think they're actually dominated by verbs and, verbs and connections. Yeah. Um, the reality is, we're always dealing in abstractions. So Deakin in his symbolic species totally demolished Chomsky's theories of language yeah, by demonstrating the way that symbolism is so key to language and semiotics is key in terms of the way it works. So I think that's something AI will never replicate. And to be honest, I refuse to call it AI. Um, it's machine learning. And we need to call it machine learning. That's what it is. And the most important thing is what the hell do you train it on? When I remember 20 years ago, John Poindexter, you might remember, was Reagan's NSI. I was working for him, and he and I were on a platform in Washington. And somebody said, what do you think about AI? And we both said simultaneously, nobody's thinking about the training data sets. Now, 20 years on, Google have worked out that they end up only recruiting white male managers if they just use raw algorithms. If you haven't read Scholastic Parrots, go and read it. I mean, the woman who wrote it was a Google employee until the day she published, then she wasn't a Google employee anymore, but it's really worth reading. Yeah. Oh God, competing values framework. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why it is, all right? I think, and I blame St. Augustine for this, by the way. I, I could blame St. Paul. Uh, but St. Paul took the worst of Christian teaching, Augustine took the worst of St. Paul, and Calvin took the worst of Augustine. Uh, Augustine was a Manichaean, and he carried Manichaeism across into Christianity. So, you know, everything is evil unless you, you come, to, come to the good Lord and get solved, right? And there's this Manichaean tendency in Western thought as a result. So everybody wants to have good things on the right and bad things on the left. And of course, the bad things are all these terrible things that people have done in the past. And the stuff on the right is all these wonderful things that we'll do if only you employ me as a consultant. Right? Every time I see those on the Internet these days, I hit them with kind of like there's nothing wrong with the stuff on the left. And the stuff on the right is too idealistic anyway. And the whole point about competing values framework is we don't think in dichotomies. That's not the way humans think. A phrase I created years ago, I said humans are messily coherent. 
messy coherence. Yeah, we're not structured in dichotomies. And if you try and structure us in dichotomies, all evil ensues. I wouldn't go near competing value framework. Can you tell us a little bit more about, I, I've heard some of your talks about systems thinking, um, some of the concerns you have about it. And, and I, to me, there's lots of different definitions of it. So sometimes I'm unclear about which variant of it are you most critical of and why? Well, I think it it's, it's systems thinking and it's complexity science. I think that's significant. And I think systems thinking, and I was heavily involved in cybernetics in the early days with Frank Land and LSE and stuff like that. And I did a lot of work with Peter Checkland and based a lot of our workshop techniques on soft systems. Yeah, uh, Systems dynamics, I always thought was bloody stupid and I still think is bloody stupid. And, and so do most people I respect in systems thinking. They get really upset when anybody asserts their ideas with systems dynamics and Peter Senge until they want his name on their conference platforms. Yeah. So I think you have to separate systems dynamics from soft systems from cybernetics. Yeah. And then you've got to separate it from sort of generic talking, you know, the sort of common language about we need to think about the system as a whole. Well, from a complexity perspective, you can't think about the system as a whole. That's one difference right up front. Yeah, you're talking about micro interactions within constraints. Yeah, and then fast monitoring, fast feedback loops, so you can reinforce good things and reinforce bad things. One of the other big differences is everybody I know in systems thinking says systems are defined by boundaries. In complexity, not all systems have boundaries. And that changes. It means the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply just start to think through the implications of that. So I've got a huge amount, and, and if you don't know it, I'm giving the Michael Jackson lecture at Hull University. So I think Michael plans to take me apart and I plan to take him apart. We're both thoroughly looking forward to it. Um, um, but I'm gonna focus on that lecture on the new stuff, which is coming out of complexity science in terms of what we do. I think I have a huge amount of respect for what the systems thinkers did. Um, I think some of them never should have had the word cybernetics. So I think Jeffrey Bateson has nothing whatsoever to do with modern cybernetics. Yeah, I think he was brilliant. I think you know a lot of his stuff was on biology. I think it was unfortunate he chose that term. Um, so I think soft systems is brilliant, but doesn't scale. Cybernetics, we can use the pattern-based stuff, but the patterns aren't fine-grained enough. Systems dynamics assumes causality. It's all great stuff. Time to move on a bit. Thank you for that. Hey, David, uh, Dave, thank you. This is great talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, and I, I agree with you. Um, why do less understood terms take over the concepts, you know, in management or agile? Or is it, is it less distribution and understanding of knowledge? Or is it an elite masses problem? Or what causes that, if you agree? I think part of the problem, and, and I, I really hesitate to agree with the metamodernists because I'm developing an intense dislike for metamodernism, which is only getting worse the more I look into it. Um, and the idea that a few elitist Americans can design a new religion, which is what some of them are trying to do, is totally appalling. Uh, but where I do sort of agree with them is that actually this whole fad cycle, the, the mystical words and populism, um, I don't think it's a crisis of meaning. I think they're getting that wrong. Um, but I think it's the loss of meaning that religious cohesion used to provide. I mean, certainly when I was growing up, you know, people weren't necessarily religious, but they all went to church. Uh, Mary Boone, who I write with, whenever I stay with her, I go to a local church. It's mostly a political meeting. It has a few hymns for token purposes, but it's really where the community come together and they solve things. So I think people are looking, I, th I think there's two factors. People are looking for some sort of meaning. And with very fast turnover of staff, remember it used to be people join companies for life. Yeah, and they don't do that anymore. So I think there's something missing. Um, and I think they're there for a temptation to use words or fads. I think the other problem is the consultancy industry. I mean, it grew on the back of business process re-engineering in the 80s. Before that, it was deeply experienced. It's a manufacturing framework. 
they have to produce a new magic wonder pill every three to four years and keep cycling and companies keep falling for it the last one didn't work they take the new one it was like you know we we had mission statements from akoff which was i mean akoff would be appalled by what happened with his idea since then they became value statements then they became purpose statements and they're about to become deep purpose statements if you don't know deep purpose is just coming Every single one of those is a bunch of platitudes written on a white paper by some very expensive consultants with an appalling communication plan and total bloody disappointment which follows. Anybody who studied anthropology can tell you the minute you write your values down, you just lost them. And I'll come back to what I said on vector theory. We actually say we don't want to be, we don't want stories like this and we do want stories like those. That gives far more purpose than a set of platitudes. More stories like this, fewer stories like that. It's very easy to get people to agree on that. It's very difficult to get them to agree on very abstract language.